friends, welcome to day four, nope, day five of the five day regression challenge. Um, today, we're going to be talking about selecting which input variables to put into your model. Um, so I've started putting links to the previous days at the top of our notebooks. Uh, and yesterday we learned about how to fit and interpret a multiple regression model. So that's a model where you have one output and then multiple inputs that you're, you're using to predict that output. Uh, and previously we've just sort of like picked things with our eyes that looked like they'd be reasonable or interesting. And today we're going to talk about how to automatically select which input variables to use and which input variables are likely to have an effect. So there's two big problems with picking input variables. One is overfitting and one is multicollinearity. So overfitting is a big problem in any machine learning application. And the idea is that uh, when you're training any sort of machine learning model and linear regression, the way that we're doing it is a machine learning model. Um, yeah, I guess nobody does it in a way where it wouldn't be anymore. Um, overfitting is when your model is so powerful and it's so good at picking up patterns that it picks up patterns that are just random noise in the data. Uh, and that means that it's not going to work well on a data set that isn't your test, uh, the, the data set that you trained on, right? Uh, so in general, more complex models are more likely to overfit and models that have more input variables are more likely to overfit. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is multicollinearity. So we've been using uh, general generalized linear models. Sorry, guys. Uh, I got a general linear models are a different set of models. Generalized linear models are the ones that we've been working on. Who let statisticians name stuff? Um, so multicollinearity is when you have multiple input variables that are strongly related to each other. Um, so the example I use here is age and the number of birthdays you had, because those are, you know, functions of the same underlying thing, which is the number of days you've been alive in the world, right? Or um, another example of something you'd expect to be very multicollinear is uh height and weight across let's say every organism on earth generally very short organisms are very light very tall organisms are very heavy um so that's something that's going to be uh there's going to be a strong relationship between those input variables and the uh way that we've been fitting our models is using ordinary least squares and you don't need to know anything about it just know that that's what we're using um, and ordinarily squares is really bad at dealing with multicollinearity. And what will happen is your model will uh, have really, really high errors for inputs that are very uh, multicollinear. So when you're selecting variables, those are two things to think about. Fortunately, we don't have to solve these problems. Other people have solved them for us. Uh, so we're going to use something called elastic net. So I mentioned that so far we've been fitting our models using uh, ordinary least squares. Elastic net is just another way of fitting a model. Um, it's called a regularization technique. Uh, and it's a combination of something called lasso regression and uh, ridge regression. And the really nice thing about elastic net is that it deals very well with multicollinearity. So if there's a group of variables that together are very predictive, uh, it'll take the whole group rather than sort of like randomly selecting one or not selecting any of them. Uh, and also if there's a variable that isn't very important, it will force the coefficient of that variable to zero, which removes it from the model, right? Because if you remove some, if you multiply something by zero, it's zero and it just gets, you know, it's nothing, it gets taken out. So we're going to use elastic net to select our variables for us. And the example that we're going to use is uh, predicting new coders income from uh, we've got two data sets from the free code camp uh, organization, I guess, business. Uh, and one of them is a 2016 survey and the other one is a 2017 survey. And I'm going to be working with the 2016 survey and then you guys can check in the 2017 survey. And we're going to predict income based on a number of different features. So uh, one thing about the, the uh, package that we're using, this GLM net package, which is uh, an implementation of elastic net for generalized linear models, is that it needs your input variables to be in a matrix. So a matrix is like a data frame, but it only has numbers in it. So it can only take numbers as input. 
So if I want to use something like gender, I need to convert gender, something like male, female, uh, non-binary, into a number. So I'm adding a column to my data frame, uh, is woman, and I am saying that this column is whatever is in this uh, gender column. If it is equal to female, then is woman is one. If it is anything else, is woman is zero. Um, so it's a Boolean vector, and in R, Boolean vectors, true, false, are uh, numeric, because true is one and false is zero. So uh, this will work fine in our uh, matrix that we're making. And then I'm also selecting some other variables that are uh, uh, numeric. So I'm looking at people's age and years, how much time they spend commuting, whether or not they have children, whether they've attended a coding boot camp, whether they're a woman. Uh, so that's that new feature I just made. Uh, what do they have debt, the hours of per week they spend learning, the total months they've been programming, and then their income, which is what I'm trying to predict. And then I'm removing NA values, uh, because if you try to uh, pass a matrix, a matrix, a matrix that has NA values in it to GLMNet, it will blow up and, and yell at you. Uh, and then I'm going to take only the variables I'm predicting. So I'm predicting income, so I want to remove income. I'm selecting everything but income. That's what that little minus means. And then I'm converting it to a matrix. And then I'm getting a vector of our outputs. So that leaves me with uh, 2,700 uh, examples, basically. And because we have several thousand examples, ooh, sorry, I'm knocking everything over on my desk. Uh, because we have several thousand examples, we can actually, even though this is probably best modeled by a Poisson distribution, if we want, we can use a Gaussian distribution. So we can use a uh, linear regression rather than a Poisson regression, because as your data set gets bigger, um, the, these two, two distributions tend to converge. So now we've got uh, a numeric matrix of our input variables and a vector of our output variable. And we can feed this to uh, this CVGLMNet feature. And we do want to specify family, just like we've been doing all along. And the reason it has CV in front of it is because it's using cross-validation. So the idea here is that you only train your model on part of your data set. And then you train a second model on another part of your data set. And then you train a third model on another part of your data set. So you're taking little samples from your data set. Well, little. Uh, in this case, it's 90% of your data set each time, but it's a different 90%. And this sort of helps you converge on, on what seems most likely. Uh, and once we have all of those models, we pick the best one. Uh, or... Yeah, of the averages of them, we pick the best one. And then we can get the intercepts of that. So, excuse me. So this is a regression model uh, that we have fit. So this is the, the best model uh, out of our set of cross-validated models. That's what lambda.min equals. And it's the coefficients from that model. So this is the coefficient for the intercept, the coefficient for age, commute time, has children, attended boot camp, is woman. And you'll notice that has debt has a period instead of a number. That's because this is represented as a sparse matrix. Uh, and a sparse matrix doesn't actually have zeros in it. It just says uh, it, it will be represented with a period. Uh, and that means that because there's no number there, it's much more efficient to store in memory, which is why we put the input variables in a matrix to begin with, because then they can be converted to a sparse matrix, and it's much more efficient. And you don't, you don't need to know what's going on under the hood, but it just runs faster this way. So what this tells us is that uh, these variables are important. We can ignore the intercept, uh, but has debt is not. So the elastic net uh, regularization term has forced has debt to zero because it's not sufficiently helpful. So we don't want to use has debt in our production. So um, you could stop here. This is uh, the models that we have fit with cross-validation. These are regression models. You can just call it a day. I'm going to refit another regression model using just these interesting uh, variables. And then we're going to look at that using some of the techniques that we've used so far. But you could stop here if you wanted. Uh, and you can also predict with this model. Oh, I guess we've never actually done prediction. Well, noted. All of these, uh, all of these uh, packages that we're using have um, uh, prediction built into them. So you can, you can take a new set of input variables, values for your input variables, and predict based on those. 
Okay, uh, so what we are doing is we are converting this into a non-sparse matrix. And then, so we're basically taking this and replacing it with zero. Uh, and then we are looking through all of the variables and on the rows where the uh, uh, coefficient is not equal to zero, so basically everything but this one, we are taking the name of that row. So we're gonna get all of these. Uh, and because the intercept also isn't zero, I want to remove the intercept because that's not an interesting input variable. Uh, and then we can see just the first couple variables that we have. So this will work um, on any type of model that you get out, regardless of how many variables it has. Uh, I'm really, as you can see, I'm trying very hard to avoid typing things uh, because I tend to make mistakes. Uh, and also this means that it's going to be reusable and easier to use later on. So uh, here's just the head of the variable. So it's going to be the first six terms in our variables. And to put those into a formula that we can give to the GLM function that we've been using, I'm just going to paste them together. <laughs> so I'm going to put in, uh, take all of my variables and I'm going to put a plus sign between all of them. Uh, and then I'm going to put uh, this income squiggle tilde in front of them. Uh, and then I'm going to convert that to a formula object. So I'm just creating a formula using this list of variables. And then I'm going to fit uh, a data set just like just like we've done. I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to fit a, a model just like we've done. I decided to use a Gaussian model. Uh, I'm using the data data subset. And then this is the formula that we've made up here. Uh, and let's check out our diagnostic plots. So uh, I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see them all at the same time. It's okay. It's not the you know prettiest, most beautiful possible model, but you're never going to get that. Um, and if you do, maybe something's wrong. Um, this looks okay. Uh, we're a little bit off, especially for very high salaries, which I think is not surprising. We tend to be underestimating them. Uh, and I think that's not surprising because if you're making like $125,000 as a brand new coder uh, a year, something else is going on. Like maybe you have a lot of background knowledge or maybe like you're, I don't know, we're already, I don't know, an electrical engineer, I guess. And you're just adding a specialization. Um, so these are, these are very much sort of interesting but not the core of our data these points and th these are the ones that we're we're more off for and you can see that that sort of underestimation here as well uh, that we tend not to do very well at the very high end of the of the salary range which is fine um same thing here you can see that that these points are, are pretty spread out but this isn't you know this isn't bad uh it seems to we're not we're not really uh violating uh normality assumptions too too badly uh, and then there aren't any super uh, outlying individual points, which is good. So when we look at our model, um, you can see that it's just telling us that our formula is this formula object that we used instead of the full formula. So that is that is something to know. If you wanted to see what the formula actually is, you're going to have to print it out. And uh, looking at the residuals, our median is uh, below zero. So we do have a bit of a skew. We knew that going in. Um, and this, so, so this is a big number, but if you think of this in dollars, like our, our median, our skew is um, negative in terms of, you know, $7,000 a year, which is, you know, not no money, but in terms of salaries, uh, not a horrible amount of, of wiggle room. Excuse me. Uh, and then looking at the coefficients, and again, we're just ignoring the p-values, uh, you can see that all of these are not zero. Uh, and if you subtract the standard error from them, they don't overlap with zero. Uh, but the the numbers, the um, estimates are actually different than what we got from our uh, elastic net model. So these are both linear regression models. Uh, this one is being fit using a different technique. So we're getting slightly different numbers out. Uh, and we can see, looking at this, it looks like the most important feature is uh, whether or not someone has children, because uh, that has the, the largest estimate and also, you know, fairly small error. Uh, and also months programming seems to be uh, very important. And the error relative to the number of months, uh, to the, the estimate for the month, number of months programming is very small. So um, this times 100 would be 100, this times 10 would be 106. Uh, and this is more than that. So we know that we can be pretty sure that months programming does have an effect. Um, and this is not quite 10 times the estimate what the error is, but you know, this is still seems to be, be fairly robust. 
So if we look at our AV plots, which we learned about yesterday, scroll, um, we can see that age has a very positive effect. Uh, commute time doesn't really have effect, a little bit of a negative effect. Um, so especially at the, the higher end, it looks like uh, a shorter commute time is associated with, sorry, longer commute time is associated with a lower salary. Um, here you can see there's not that strong of an effect of have children. So the, the um, coefficient is large, but so is the standard error. You can see there's a, a big spread. These are uh, categorical variables. So um, one is attended a boot camp, zero is did not attend a boot camp. Uh, and here one is is a woman and zero is is not a woman. Uh, and you can see that's sort of, I don't know how you can see, this is sort of negative. Uh, and this is a little bit negative, but these don't seem to be uh, especially robust. Um, and you can see that months programming is by far the strongest signal in this data. If we look at the slopes of all these lines, this one has the most dramatic slope. Uh, and that sort of makes sense. It makes sense that age and months programming and kind of has children are all related to each other uh, because these are related to sort of like the underlying idea of experience. If you're older and you've spent more months programming, you're probably more experienced and you can probably, you know, um, uh, command a higher salary. Uh, and related, if you're older, you probably have children. So there's probably a relationship between age and has children, that multicollinearity that I was talking about. Uh, and we have uh, included all of these in our, in our model. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, I've got some uh, code for you guys to, I've got some exercises for you guys to do um, to use elastic net to pick your variables. And that's pretty much it. So. Good luck, good luck, good work, good work completing the challenge. Thanks very much for joining me, and I hope you guys had fun. I, I definitely had fun. Uh, and I'm going to spend this morning going through and answering people's questions. So if you asked a question I didn't get to it yesterday, sorry, I'll do it today. All right. Um, hopefully I'll see you guys around on Kaggle. That was really, really nice working with you. Bye-bye.